If this were ancient Greece, and I were to ask you, what is the biological source of cognition, of thinking? You would say to me, why, it's the heart, of course. And if I were to wait a thousand years and ask you again, what's the biological source of thinking, of cognition, you would say, well, the ventricular system, and a thousand years after that, the pineal gland. But if I were to ask you today, what is the biological source of cognition? I think I would be hard-pressed to find any answer other than it's the brain. Over these many years, our perspectives have changed. Perspectives do change, and they should change in the face of new information. However, sometimes it's a change in perspective that's necessary to precipitate these shifts. Now, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and a memory researcher. That means I spend every day thinking about that three-pound lump of gelatinous tissue sitting inside your skull and the ways it shapes how you think, how you learn, and how you remember. For centuries, people like me and perhaps like you have been interested in understanding the function of the brain. However, for a long time, there was a very large problem. And that problem, of course, is that the brain is situated inside the skull, which is thick, it's rigid, rigid, it's woefully opaque, and it makes it really hard to observe the brain. So before the advent of neuroimaging, things like, um, things like MRI or ultrasound, human neuroscience researchers were really kind of restricted to taking advantage of two opportunities to observe the brain. One of those opportunities was autopsy, and the second was when somebody experienced brain damage. Now, work with brain-damaged patients was and still is enormously influential in our understanding of brain behavior or structure-function relationships. And in fact, it's almost impossible to exaggerate the impact of patient work on the study of human memory. The patients I'm speaking of have damage to a particular region in the brain situated really deep in the middle part of the brain. It's called the hippocampus. And the traditional view is that the hippocampus is essential for the formation of long-lasting declarative memories. So these are memories for facts and events. And much of our understanding of hippocampal function came from patient work in the, in the 1950s. And one patient in particular, who is known to the research world as HM. As a young man, patient HM experienced severe and debilitating epilepsy. And in 1953, in an effort to alleviate his seizures, a surgery was performed, a surgery to remove his bilateral hippocampus. Now, after the surgery, his seizure disorder did improve, but there was one unexpected and devastating side effect. He was no longer able to create any new memories. He could remember where he was born, he could remember who his parents were, he could remember things about his childhood, but for the subsequent 50 years, he was unable to create or form any new memories. His intellect was intact, his language, his motor skills were unimpaired, but he had this profound memory deficit. He could only hold on to information for a very short period of time before it was gone. Now, if this particular disorder sounds familiar to you, it might be because you've seen the movie Memento. If you haven't seen it, it's really an excellent film. In many ways, it's able to accurately recreate the experience of anterograde amnesia. That's the disorder when you have damage to your hippocampus, anterograde amnesia. It recreates that experience for the viewer. And at one point, Leonard, he's the main character, he describes his condition. He talks about how everything he experiences, everything he learns, fades away. And that was very much the experience for HM. He could hold on for information for a very short period of time, and then it was gone. So for years, researchers studied in great detail the limits of his memory, the deficit, the things he could not remember. But then a change in perspective occurred. In 1962, a paper was published highlighting something that he could remember. It, re it reported his performance on a mirror tracing task. This is a task where he was asked to trace on a piece of paper a shape that was only visual, visible to him through a mirror. So it's actually a really hard task. It might sound kind of easy, but he made lots of mistakes early on. But with each subsequent repetition, he got better. He improved. And then the next day, when he came back, although he had absolutely no conscious recollection of ever having even seen the task before, that's his declarative memory deficit, he showed marked improvement from the first trial on the first day. His procedural memory had been spared. So this changed perspectives, a shift in focus, away from what HM couldn't remember to what he could remember. And that task required a great deal of creativity to come up with new tools and new tasks to probe the gamut of his abilities. 
And with this new perspective, with the data that accumulated, new theories of hippocampal function developed. And one um, influential theory is called relational memory theory. It says that what the hippocampus does is it takes arbitrary pieces of information, the who, the what, the where, the when of events, and it binds them together into a coherent representation that can be used flexibly, depending on the situation or the task goals. Memory's not static, it's flexible. This theory and the data it precipitated um, really changed perspective. For me, relational memory is the crux of real-world memory. It's how I remember that the same arbitrary string of 10 digits is necessary every time I want to call my mom. It's how I remember where specifically in the parking deck I, I parked my car every day. This is real-world memory. And what this research showed us is that if you don't have a hippocampus, if you have enterograde amnesia, what you have is a deficit in relational memory. But this is a really extreme example not having a hippocampus at all. And fortunately, it only affects a very small number of people. The rest of us have a hippocampus, and that's good. But not every hippocampus is the same. Um, and MRI research has shown us that the hippocampus changes as we develop and as we age. What I'm showing you here is just a cartoon depiction of how the hippocampus, the size of the hippocampus, varies across the lifespan. So when you're a child, as you develop, the hippocampus grows. And during this period of childhood, there's an interesting relationship between the size of your hippocampus and your ability to perform relational memory tasks. Children with large hippocampi have better relational memory abilities. The same thing is true as we age. As we age, the hippocampus atrophies. It shrinks, it gets smaller. But older adults, oh, missed it. Older, older adults who have large hippocampi have better relational memory abilities. However, there's this period in the middle, right? this period that we call young adulthood, where the hippocampus remains pretty stable. And any individual differences between the size of the hippocampus during this period really don't seem to be related to performance on relational memory tasks. However, it's possible that there are smaller changes occurring, changes that we can't see with traditional MRI, but are just as important to our understanding of function. So this is where I was, what I knew three years ago. Now, I work at a place called the Beckman Institute here on the University of Illinois campus. And the Beckman Institute is a large um, science facility where scientists of different backgrounds and uh, different disciplines work together and are encouraged to do this collaborative, um, interdisciplinary work. And to sort of facilitate that, there are always talks happening all of the time on all sorts of different subjects, and everybody's invited to come. So three years ago, I attended a talk by Dr. Curtis Johnson. He's a mechanical engineer. Now, I am not in the habit of going to engineering talks, quite frankly, because I find them confusing. But this choice to go to this talk on this particular day was monumental to my thinking, to my work, and to my entire research program. This talk changed my perspective. It showed me a new way to approach my work and reminded me that when you change your perspective, immense opportunities come to you. So the topic of the talk was Magnetic Resonance Elastography, or MRE. So what MRE does is it provides a measure of the mechanical properties of the brain. Now, at this point, you might be asking two questions. First of all, how do you measure the mechanical properties of the brain? You just told me it's sitting inside a skull. You can't poke at it. Second of all, you might be asking, why on earth would you want to do such a thing? So let's start with the how. How it works is just like if you've had a regular MRI, you come into the laboratory, you come to the doctor's office, and we lay you in an MRI magnet. One difference is we place a tiny vibrating pillow behind your head. The pillow vibrates and it sends waves through your brain, and those waves displace. So to understand this, I want you to think about a pond on a clear day. It's impossible to see below the surface. But if you slap the water, you send ripples across the pond, if there's anything below the surface that's big, it's dense, it's a rock, those ripples are going to displace. This is essentially how elastography works. We send waves through the tissue, they displace, we measure that displacement, and we reconstruct it into elasticity maps. And those maps tell us about the underlying health, organization, and integrity of the tissue. So um, MRE is a measure of microstructural integrity, microstructural organization. And in mechanical engineering, microstructural shifts precede large structural changes. And maybe that's true in the brain. 
maybe tiny microstructural dysfunction precedes gross macrostructural change, like volume changes we see as we age. And maybe microstructural differences are informative to cognition. So sitting in this talk, I'm beginning to wonder, can we measure the microstructure of the hippocampus specifically, and might it show a relationship with relational memory performance? The thing we don't see a relationship with volume this, during young adulthood when, you know, volume is stable. So I stayed after the talk, and I talked to Dr. Johnson, and we started to talk about the possibility. Is it possible to measure hippocampal microstructure? Now, Curtis, as I mentioned, is a mechanical engineer, which of course means he loves a challenge. And I didn't know it at the time, but he's also exactly the type of person you want to work with, because he's extremely enthusiastic, but also an extraordinarily skilled and capable researcher. So he immediately set out to work his engineering magic, and as a result, we were able to re reliably measure the elasticity of the hippocampus. Might be saying, okay, <laughs> great. I was excited, and I'll tell you why. Um, so, we could get this measure. And we wanted to look at the relationship with cognition, which meant that I had to go talk to my boss. His name's Neil Cohen. And I had to say, Neil, I've been talking to this guy, and he has this tool, and we can measure the elasticity of the hippocampus, and I have an idea. And it's going to be expensive. <laughs> and it's new, so it's probably not going to work. But theoretically, it makes sense. And because Neil's also exactly the type of person you want to work with, he's enthusiastic, but he's also willing to give reasonable things a shot. So he said, go for it, get some pilot data. So we did. We collected data from 20 healthy, young, male university students. We brought them into the laboratory, we gave them an MRE scan, and we also had them perform a relational memory task. Then we looked at the relationship. So what I'm going to show you here on the horizontal axis is memory performance. So here are higher numbers, I guess those are over here, higher numbers indicate better performance. On the vertical axis, I'm going to show you hippocampal elasticity. This is our measure of microstructural integrity. So again, higher numbers better. What we saw is a strong positive relationship between hippocampal microstructure and relational memory performance. Even among 20-year-olds, healthy 20-year-olds for whom there's no volume change, no dysfunction. So we were pretty floored. But we had to do a few things. We had to, first of all, make sure we could replicate this finding. That's important in science. You want to be able to replicate the things that you find. Second of all, we needed to know how specific this finding was. So maybe MRE measures of any old brain region would show the same relationship with memory. It would suggest that these measures are picking up something global, but not specific to hippocampal integrity. So we replicated the study. We brought in 52 new, um, healthy young adults, this time a more diverse sample of men and women, and again we saw a strong, significant correlation between MRE measures of hippocampal integrity and memory performance. Fortunately, and interestingly, and importantly, we did not see this relationship in the visual cortex. The visual cortex should not be involved in memory function, so this was a nice proof of concept. It showed that our tool was specific, and it was also sensitive. So then we wanted to push it a little farther. There's a whole literature that suggests there are things that you can do to change the structure of your hippocampus. And one of the things that you can do is exercise. There are many studies with children and older adults that suggest that individuals who have better aerobic fitness, people who are more fit, have larger hippocampi and in turn perform better on relational memory tasks. But again, we don't see that among those healthy young adults. So we set out to test this. We brought people back into the laboratory, we had them do a fitness test, and we did all the things we did in the last study, and what we found was, yes, there is a strong, significant relationship between aerobic fitness, the how fit you are, and the microstructural integrity of your hippocampus, and how well you perform on relational memory tasks. So these data were interesting, but they were also inspiring to us. There are so many disorders that are associated with memory deficits. Anterograde grade amnesia is one, Alzheimer's, dementia, epilepsy, schizophrenia, traumatic brain injury, and many more are all associated with memory deficits or hippocampal dysfunction. So what the data I've shown you suggest is that there are hippocampal microstructural differences, and these differences matter for memory performance. So maybe we can use this new tool with sensitive measures of behavior early on. And maybe we can help identify people who are at risk for developing memory disorders later on. 
And with early detection, maybe there are ways we can intervene, stave off precipitous decline. These are early days, they are theoretical ideas right now, a lot of work needs to take place. But it's an interesting prospect. The other thing I hope to have conveyed to you today is that science is dynamic, and cognitive neuroscience is no exception. Despite the methodological rigor, the precision of our, our measures, the immense power of the tools that we use, understanding brain behavior or structure-function relationships isn't always clear-cut. And that's because the brain is dynamic. It's always changing, always shifting. But sometimes, if we're able to change our own perspective, to take a different vantage point, to be a little creative in our pursuits, it's in those moments that we can glean a new understanding and a better appreciation for even those things that we thought we understood. Thank you.